Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 7 through 13. <clears throat> you deceived me, Lord, and I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I'm ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I cry out, proclaiming violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. But if I say I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. I hear many whispering, terror on every side. Denounce him, let's denounce him. All my friends are waiting for me to slip, saying, perhaps he will be deceived. Then we will prevail over him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior, so my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will fail and be thoroughly disgraced. Their dishonor will never be forgotten. Lord Almighty, you who examine the righteous and probe the heart and mind, let me see your vengeance on them. For to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, give praise to the Lord. He rescues the life of the needy from the hands of the wicked. Amen. topic for this morning is Jeremiah's complaint. Jeremiah's complaint. Every now and then I do a little something funny, a little silly to start off with to break the tension, to get us to relax a little bit. And, uh, this one kind of cracked me up. This is a pastor's joke I heard from a minister many years ago. Archie and Jack they debated their whole life as to whether Jesus was, was white or black. Archie was certain that he was white, and Jack was just as sure that, that he was black. As fate would have it, both of them died on the same day and <laughs> rushed, to the, rushed to the pearly gates. They, there they saw St. Peter, and they stopped St. Peter. They said, please tell us. We've been arguing all our lives. Is, is Jesus white or black? Just then, just about that time, Jesus stepped up and said, Buenos dias. <laughs> Amen. I like that one too, thank you. Uh, let's bow our heads to the word of <laughs> Let's bow our heads to the word of prayer. A little serious now here. Father God, we thank you for this day to be together. We ask your blessings on the message as it goes forth, that it will be clear that you would make it what you want it to be, that it would touch our hearts in a special way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The title is Jeremiah's Complaint. You know, to complain means that you're dissatisfied with something. All of us have complained about something. Amen? Amen? Whether it's the food wasn't cooked well, or the soup was too lukewarm, or they didn't have this at the store when I went to get it, or we complain about the traffic, how long it took us to get to where we were going, trying to go to a concert and the traffic took us forever, or when someone's rude to us, and we complain. Is there anybody in here who has never complained about anything, something? Amen. We've all complained about something. Jeremiah is complaining. We protest or complain about the rising prices or the, the food shortage, the, the shortage of whatever, whatever it might be. I remember going to the store to buy something for Irene, and they didn't have any more, they didn't have any iceberg lettuce. They said they weren't shipping it up to Boston. So 
we didn't have iceberg lettuce, we got something else. But, you know, I mean, well, I wasn't complaining about it, but I could have, I wanted to, but. <laughs> having something that disappoints us, makes us whine or grumble or speak out against whatever it is, and we criticize, that's complaining. There's a story that a Catholic bishop told years ago, and there was a couple family, they were coming from church, and they were complaining, all right? They didn't like the music, they thought that so-and-so didn't sing that well, and they didn't like all the hats that some of the ladies were wearing at church, and uh, they should have come to First Baptist, they wouldn't have to worry about it. <laughs> but they, they were complaining about this, they were complaining about that, they, the church didn't have air conditioning, the fans, this, that, the other. They were just complaining about everything. And the, the oldest boy in the, in the back seat of the car said, well, mom, dad, what do you expect for a dollar? <laughs> we complain, and yet we get what we pay for. Amen. They didn't put anything into the service to contribute to the service. Anyway, I want to give you a little bit about Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a major prophet, before I get into the complaint. Jeremiah wrote almost as much as Isaiah. Isaiah was the uh, mega prophet. He wrote 66 uh, chapters. The book of Isaiah, 66 chapters. And Jeremiah is a close second. Jeremiah wrote 52 chapters. And of course he wrote even more because later on you have what's known as the Lamentations, the expressions of sorrow, the Lamentations of Jeremiah. He was a prolific prophet, but he was also known among the Jews, and we know today he was known as the weeping prophet because he cried a lot. His heart was just poured out for his Jewish Family. He was mournful a lot of the times. And there are several chapters where they are specific laments, so expressions of sorrow. If you read chapter 11 in Jeremiah, you will see some of the sorrow. Chapter 12, chapter 15, <coughs> chapter 17, chapter 18, and then this chapter that we're looking at this morning, chapter 20, is a lament. He is very, very upset, and he's complaining. Just so you know, the name Jeremiah had a double meaning. Jeremiah, on one hand, meant to build up, but it also meant to pull down. And the Yah at the end, Jeremiah, Yah, has to do with the name of God. So God, essentially, is the one who has the ability to, to build up, and God uses us to bring down. And that's exactly what God wanted to do with Jeremiah. He asked him, would you preach for me? And Jeremiah, of course, was saying that, I don't think I can do that because I don't know how to speak. I'm only a youth. But God said to Jeremiah, don't worry about being young because the words that I give you, I will put in your mouth. You don't have to worry about what to say. I will put those words in your mouth to prophesy. Amen. Jeremiah was probably born around 650 BC in Anathoth in Judah, and he lived until around 570, some 600 years before Jesus Christ came to this earth as the Son of God. Jeremiah was prophesying. And he prophesied some 40 years, just to give you a little bit of history of this incredible man of God. But one of the things that's interesting is that as God had promised him, I will bring you through, I will deliver you, Jeremiah sort of misinterpreted it, just like some of us do. You know, a lot of times people say, just come to Jesus, come to the Lord. And all your problems will go away. Well, don't believe that, because sometimes your problems just begin when you come to Christ. You make a decision, a concerted effort to follow the Lord, and then 
some of your friends that you thought were your friends, they, they, they ostracize you. They don't want to have anything to do with you. Now you're, you're weird. You're different. What do you mean? You're, you believe in that? And then they ostracize us. I like this quote by Rosa Parks. She said, I have learned over the years that when one's mind is made up, this diminishes fear, knowing that what must be done does away with fear. I'm going to read that again. Rosa Parks said this concerning fear, being apprehensive about doing the thing you know you should do. She says, I have learned over the years that when one's mind is made up, this diminishes fear, knowing that what must be done will do away with the fear. Did you get that? When you know you've got to do the right thing, that helps to dispel, get rid of the fear, so that we can focus on doing what it is God wants us to do. So why did Jeremiah complain? What was that all about? Why was he so angry? Well, first of all, <laughs> He was, he was really angry because he wasn't expecting that his serving God was going to cause him to suffer. Okay? He wasn't counting on being put in jail and beaten and put in the stocks. But that's exactly what happened when he predicted, uh, prophesied some of the uh, things that were, the events that were getting ready to take place. One of the events, as you probably know, was that the Assyrian government was over Judah in those days. But Babylon was coming. Babylon was getting ready to invade Assyria. And as they took over, that meant torture for Jewish people until later on when the Babylonians started to sort of accept the Jews a little bit more. But they, in the beginning, it was very brutal. There was a food shortage. There was a lack of food. There was a lot of torture. There was a lot of hate and animosity. Jeremiah wasn't holding back. He was prophesying that bad times were going to happen. And a lot of people didn't like that, including Pasha. Pasha was the high priest, uh, the priest of the temple in those days. And he really was very upset. It's like, who do you think you are talking about what's going to happen to us? We're doing okay. And he locked Jeremiah up. He had Jeremiah beaten, and he had him locked up, put in prison, and, and put in the stocks, the wooden thing that went around their necks. And they, in other words, they were tortured. They would torture these people. And that's what it meant to be put in the stocks and twist the head in the stocks. It was very brutal. And so Jeremiah said, you deceived me, you tricked me, God. I'm trying to serve you, and what happens? I get punished for trying to do what you want. How many of you have ever felt like that? You're trying to do the right thing, you're trying to help someone, and they, 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 they despise you. I remember my, my sister one time, I think I told the story years ago. It was Thanksgiving, and uh, some friends of hers were they, were, they were on welfare, and they didn't, have, uh, they didn't have enough money to buy a turkey for Thanksgiving. And my sister bought them a turkey, <laughs> and here she says, I, wanted to, I got this, I wanted you to have a turkey for Thanksgiving. And the woman looked at her and said, girl, you mean you're not gonna cook it too? <laughs> and my sister was like, I don't believe this. You know, some people, no matter what you do, <laughs> they, they, they don't appreciate it, you know? And that's what Jeremiah was going through. They didn't appreciate him, and he felt like God had deceived him because he wasn't expecting to be treated with brutality. He was complaining. Also, his second prophecy, which also came true, but it didn't affect him in that in that. Time, during his lifetime, he, predict, he prophesied about the destruction of Jerusalem that was going to take place in um, AD 70. That was after Jesus had come to Jerusalem, had been born and lived, and went, ascended into heaven in 33 AD. Well, 70 AD, even after the death of Paul and Peter, 
Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was completely demolished. And Jeremiah had prophesied that. So there were a lot of people who did not like Jeremiah. He was beaten, he was tortured. And then Pastor, later on, he says, well, okay, you know what? I'm going to let you go. He lets him free. <laughs> and as soon as Jeremiah has been freed from prison, freed from the torment, freed from the brutality, you know what he does? He doesn't say, well, thank you. He says, you know, your name used to be, uh, you're prosperous, but now your name is going to mean you're going to be a terror on every side. And you're going to be destroyed, they're going to carry you into exile, and you're going to die in Babylon. And that's exactly what happened. Jeremiah was still very, very, very upset. He's called the weeping prophet because he was full of tremendous anguish. Do you remember the story of Jesus in Matthew chapter 23? When he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I would have gathered you like a hen does her chicks. But you would not. And now your house is going to be left desolate. They didn't even want anything to do with Jesus. Jesus knew what it felt like. Isaiah had said, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Some of you have gone through grief, losing a loved one, losing something else, losing the, the health that you used to know. Whatever it is, we've all experienced a sense of loss during our, our, our experience on this earth. But God wants us to remember something. That's why this whole scripture is important, because there's a transition that Jeremiah goes through that I want to share with you today. And even though he says at one point, God, I, I quit, I give up, I can't do this, I can't do this. I've been locked up, I've been beaten, I've been abused, I've been through all of this, and I'm trying to serve you, I'm trying to do it your way, and it just doesn't seem to make sense. But then, there's a transitory moment. And then he says, I think it's in verse 9. But your word is in my heart. It's like a fire. It's like a fire shut up in my bones. I have to keep speaking. I can't help it. Even though I feel a little down, I feel very upset, I know that you're real. And something on the inside is just burning inside of me. And I've got to continue to do what you called me to do. I like this quote by Andrew Carnegie. All human beings can alter their lives by altering their attitude. We don't have to stay there. It's not what happens to us in life that's the, the main thing. It's how we respond. I love what Dietrich Bonhoeffer said when he was in prison in a Nazi concentration camp just before he died. He said, they may chain me but they cannot chain my mind. They can't control how I think. No matter what chains are on my wrist, it will not permeate my mind. So there are a few lessons I want to share quickly. Number one, being a Christian means taking up the cross. It's not always easy. Sometimes we have burdens that we have to bear. But if we do it with the awareness that God is with us, we can, we can, we can make it through. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Praise the Lord. Secondly, we too can expect to be rejected. We too can expect to be ridiculed by other people who don't understand us. Have you ever been misunderstood by somebody? Anybody ever been misunderstood? And you know, you're trying to explain, and they don't, you know, they've already got in their mind what who you are, what you're all about. They've already figured you out. They don't, they don't even want to hear anything you've got to say. That happens as a Christian too. People will label us because they see the joy on your face. It's like, what right have you to be happy? I'm miserable. You, you, 
this Christian thing, you know, what is that all about? It's about serving the Lord no matter what. Because what most people don't realize is, look, if God made the world in six days, as beautiful as this world is in terms of its physical attributes, just think how beautiful heaven is that Jesus has been preparing for years and years and years and years. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You know, you believe in God, believe also in me. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be with me. There are going to be beautiful streets and houses and music and singing and rejoicing. And our loved ones that are gone, guess what? They're celebrating right now. Like in a way that we have never been able to experience here on earth. Praise the Lord. Remember that God is with you. Even though people will misunderstand you and not accept you for your Christian faith, hold on to it anyway. And then the third thing is what Jeremiah discovered that I want all of us to discover today. That is there is power in the word of God. Can you all say power? Say power. 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 Amen. Thank you. I love it. Power. And a little child shall lead them. Amen. 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 Power in God's word. Jeremiah said it's like fire shut up in my bones. Fire shut up in my bones. And he wants us to feed on his word. How do we feed on his word? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> The way we feed on his word is to read his word every day. How many of you read the Bible every day? Almost. At least once a week, okay? I should get every hand now. Once a week, okay? Once every two or three days. Come on, come on. All right. Now, this week is homework time, church. Every day, read the word. Feed on it. Read a passage every day. How do you figure out, well, should I read this? Should I read that? Should I read that? You know, start in the book of John. Start in the Psalms. When I told people how I first started, my aunt told me, read a psalm a day. So I would read the psalm that correlates to the date. So today is the 25th. We read Psalm 25, and we read Proverbs 25. Tomorrow I'll read Psalm 26 and Proverbs 26. And we just recycle each month. We go right back, because you'll always learn something new. It doesn't mean that you have to read, 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 read a whole bunch of things, although that's good too. But get into his word every day. Get into a, a systematic uh, exercise of reading his word every day so that you can grow. So you can have that fire burning in you and God can use you to help pick up somebody else when they're hurting, when they're struggling. We have a lot of people in our world today that are hurting. They're dying. They're lost. And God wants to empower you, all of us. It's not just Gary and me. All of us are ministers. Hello? Amen. Did that go over anybody's head? All of us are ministers. We're to care about one another. Praise the Lord. So the third thing is there's power in his word. How do we get the, how do we feed on his word? By reading a passage every day. And here's my little sort of takeaway. When you read, just, just as you read a little bit, just take it in, take a deep breath. Let's practice this real quick. I'm just going to say, and you repeat this. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. Say that. The, the Lord is my shepherd, shall not be in want. And now as you've said that, just take a deep breath and breathe it in. Breathe it in. Amen. And then you can exhale. You're, you're feeding on God's word. And as you practice feeding on his word, the great painter, Rock, Rockwell Kent, Kent once said, it's in the quietness, it's in the quietness that the soul expands. Sometimes it's not even saying it out loud, it's just being still before God and allow Him to speak to your heart. There are times when I pray, I pray for everybody here, 
Many, uh, you know, we, we've been praying for different family members. Every single day we keep praying for, you know, the new people I have. I, I don't know, I don't know you, but, you know, praise God, the ones that I know I've been praying for. And I'm glad to see my, my long lost friend Phil here today after all these years, my goodness. Make the man feel old, I tell you, this is <laughs> unbelievable. You know, God is real, and he's faithful. He loves each one of you with an unfailing love. He loves and cares about you. And here's the deal. No matter how you may have started in life, maybe your life didn't start off so well, God can take those broken pieces and he can fix them and shape them just like he did for Jeremiah and bring you through as a work of notable excellence because he cares that much. He died on the cross for you and me that we would be redeemed. We would have a fresh, fresh, new relationship with Almighty God the Father. Amen? Amen. You know that old gospel song, listen to the hammer ring and rejoice. Listen to the hammering while they were hammering the nails in his hands. Listen to the hammering and rejoice. Listen to the hammering and see Jesus. Listen to the hammering for he's taken everything that was against us and nailed it to his cross. That's how much he loves you. That's how much he cares. And that's how much he wants to use you to be a blessing in other people's lives so that they don't have to suffer as badly as they might have had you not been in their lives. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for all that you do, Lord. Please help us take this precious word. Even though Jeremiah is complaining, he realizes that there is power in your word. And we pray that you will help us remember that there's power in the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Send me from such. of God.